background introductions on our side. So my name is Bill Burns. I'm the product manager and also the team technical lead for TotalView. I'm very happy to spend some time today with the um, uh, with everyone here and, and show what TotalView can do and answer questions and everything um, to uh, back me up and assist me through today and do uh, uh, we're sharing the presentation is my sales engineer, Dean Stewart. Um, he is uh, I, I'm based out of just out of my Boston office. Dean is based out of the UK. Um, and then uh, my account manager, Bruce Ryan, is also on with us today. So uh, any of us are happy to answer whatever questions that come up today. Okay, so let me um, take a quick look at, um, I, I kind of worked out an agenda with Wusun um, before we started, and these are the topics that we wanted to hit. It's a lot for um, actually a four hour period. This, um, this training, we customize it based on uh, the time available and, and the customer's needs on here. So for this four hour block, we're taking something that we could we, we, depending on the amount of interaction and, and um, uh, help that we do with the labs and so forth can actually span two days. We've done that with uh, some of the other DOE labs. Um, we've condensed down what we can here to provide as much value in this four hour block. So we have a lot to cover on here. Um, what we'll find is on the beginning portions of this uh, presentation today, we'll cover a lot of total views features and we will um, do some demonstrations and then you'll see the use of those features in, in um, after the break in a lot of the um, actual hands on piece that we're demonstrating here. And I'm going to talk about the labs portion here in a, in a second as well, um, just so that uh, we can understand what those labs are and how to use them. Okay, um, this is interactive. So if you have questions or anything like that during there, don't, don't be afraid to, uh, to, answer, you know, to either through chat or just, uh, you know, bring your question up. Okay, so um, let's first, um, oop, I guess, get through that. So just a, a quick thing, like um, Wootson had said, so Perforce acquired Rogue Wave, uh, it'll be two years in February. Um, and um, so Perforce has been expanding its capabilities through acquisition, um, much of what per Rogue Wave had for products complemented what Perforce's mission was and their products. So it was a, it was a great fit when they acquired us uh, in there. So we, we span 80 countries now, about 9,000 customers worldwide. Um, we cover half of the Fortune 500 and our customers out there. So um, what's nice is that we have a, a, a pretty wide portfolio now of products in four different areas. So we're gonna talk a lot about TotalView today, but uh, just you know, so you're aware with these other products out there for agile management, uh, code collaboration, um, and that's where TotalView falls under there. And the other product that people probably most well know Perforce for is their um, tradition called the Perforce BCS version control system that's now called Helix Core now um, that falls within the same tier where TotalView is at. We have a number of tools around application management and components uh, within there. And then uh, we have a big push in automated testing uh, with Helix QAC, our perfect which was another acquisition done about the same time as Rogue Wave and our clockwork tool, which um, provides static code analysis. So um, there's a wide breadth of other capabilities and products here that we can talk about as uh, any needs that you may have. So let me start off. Um, so uh, Wusun mentioned some labs um, that he has made available out there. So there's two files. Um, one is a tar file of uh, nine different PDFs and they go through uh, each of those PDFs is a specific lab with an agenda of uh, what to teach you on how to use uh, TotalView in those areas. So um, as you open each of those up, they will have instructions on which application you're gonna use, how to set up your environment and then just a series of steps to teach you like in lab one debugger basics start up basic uh, control of processes and navigation of processes and then uh, going in from there to uh, examining data viewing data editing data so doing data debugging uh, and then so forth uh, across there um, labs five and six will go into the memory debugging as and as Wusun mentioned the memory scape tool right now um, requires use of the classic version of total view it's a separate user 
interface, but it's not integrated into the new UI. Um, and just to give you a preview of what's coming, we are actively working on and anticipate uh, the first release of memory debugging, the new user interface in our February release of TotalView. Um, we'll have the ability to uh, do leak detection of your applications and examine the, the heap blocks and heap usage of your memory there. And throughout our releases uh, in 2021, we'll be building on that initial functionality and eventually deprecating and replacing the memory scape user interface as everything comes into the new UI. So it's, it's a really nice enhancement that I look forward to. So a few things I wanted to note in the, in the notes portion on the right hand side. Um, so I, I, labs five and six uh, do use memory scape on there. So it's not the new UI like I just mentioned. The, um, we provide a series of sample programs and a make file to build them. Um, the make file you want to tailor for um, it by default was configured for using GNU compilers. Um, so if you want to use your default of Intel compilers, you can tweak the make file. One thing I'll note when you do that is that um, we have what are called saved breakpoint files in um, as part of our tutorials. And TotalView will load these and automatically plant a series of breakpoints in the application. And this allows you to hit the proper points as we go through the steps of the labs, and then you can do the exercise of that portion of the lab. Uh, those are specific to the compiler. So I, I ran through and compiled everything yesterday using the default Intel compiler, and I had to recreate those breakpoint files. So my recommendation is to, to uh, configure your environment, do the module load of the GNU compilers, and use the make file and compile them that way. It'll just make it a little bit easier for you to um, prepare the programs for using them in the labs. The other thing to know is a couple of the programs do use OpenMPI. So you'll want to do a module load of OpenMPI so your environment is set up there before you run make. Uh, and then uh, MPICC and other applications that are required to build those are ready to go there. And then lastly, um, so we will talk about the ability of Python debugging in uh, uh, as part of the demonstrations today. And um, there isn't a lab right now that is specific to Python debugging, but underneath TotalView's examples area, so if you go to, when you do a module load TotalView and you, and you then find the directory of where TotalView is installed, you'll see um, underneath there, it's actually under the platform. So typically it'll be under say Linux x86, 64. Um, you'll see an examples directory. And underneath that is Python examples. And here we have some readme files and how to set up your Python environment, how to build the examples that are there, and, uh, and then how to debug them. So what Dean and I need to do is formulate this into a lab um, so that it'll be uh, another iteration in, in sequence of the lab on there. So um, just as a reference of uh, that being available. Okay. Uh, so, in at the end of today, um, if anybody is interested in working through any of the labs or questions about building the programs, I will be I will stay on after the presentation and I'm happy to help on that uh, as well. Okay, so let me just do a couple quick slides for people that might be new to TotalView here, and then we'll start jumping in uh, to a few uh, topics, a little more meat on them. So what is TotalView used for? We really look at it as two ways. Um, we talk about TotalView being a great debugger uh, for finding bugs in your applications, uh, illegal use of data or data that's not being computed correctly, uh, finding crashes in your application, anything like that, uh, using the leak detection or, or uh, other capabilities, uh, debugging maybe your CUDA or anything um, in there and just you know, making sure that the program is uh, trying to find the errors that may exist in there. But as you watch what Dean and I demonstrate and, and uh, what the labs will show on there when you run through those, is it's also just a great tool for doing what we call dynamic analysis. Uh, you can understand, get a good understanding of how your code is running, uh, and that may help you to uh, learn how to formulate, how you may need to refactor your code, you're building onto your code. It might be working perfectly fine, but now you need to add new capability on there. Staring at static code sometimes doesn't give you that picture that you need to understand, what do I need to do to get this code to, to, um, uh, to then refactor it to add new capabilities. So you'll see that there's a lot of pieces to total view and it'll give you that understanding of how it runs or to fix problems there. 
The other part to just think about as we go through on here is you're going to see a lot of capabilities of total view, whether it's setting a breakpoint, looking at data, or, or anything else there. They're all small little tools and capabilities of total view, but when combined together can solve some pretty tough problems. And that I think is the trick of any debugger, um, you know, total view included on there is understanding its capabilities and how to put them together to solve a tough problem. And that's uh, you know, one of the goals that Dean and I have today is to have you understand what is there so that um, you can apply them as you hit different problems in your code. We will run through the different features here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but we are a comprehensive C and C++ and Fortran debugger. We've been built from the beginning to handle multiple processes and multiple threads at a time. Uh, and you'll see those capabilities and how they're baked into the debugger as we go through dem different demonstrations today. We've been built from the beginning for HPC. We understand MPI, OpenMP. Uh, we have been working side by side with NVIDIA since uh, CUDA really became something that was being used within the HPC community. So, so it's more than 10 years plus that we've been um, developing our capabilities for debugging CUDA. Um, we will discuss other capabilities such as reverse debugging, the ability to debug Python, finding leaks, and, and other features in TotalView as, um, as we go through different demos demonstrations today. And we work on Linux, Mac OS, and a variety of Unix platforms. So uh, pretty much everything you see today, you can do on the different platforms. Um, uh, and uh, so it's a quick, just a quick summary of the features there. So, and as Husun kind of uh, talked about from the beginning, um, we have a new user interface on TotalView. It was um, put as the default, uh, I think it was mid 2019 that we made that switch. The classic user interface is still uh, available. Um, as we go through some of the features today, Dean and I will highlight where there are some differences still in what might exist in the classic UI versus what is in the uh, new user interface. So um, you'll find that there are some new features in the new UI that don't exist in the classic UI. And um, so we're, uh, you know, we work hard to close that gap um, and continue to do that feedback from uh, from users like yourself, help us understand what features are really important to you and need to be in the new user interface so I can priority that for my team. In general, some of the gaps um, are around visualization of data. We don't have, um, as in the old UI, you could visualize a 2D or 3D array. We're going to be embarking on a project for that for 2021 to add visualization support. Memory debugging is in progress right now. Um, the first release of that is I anticipate February to do leak detection there. And when I say high scale MPI support, we've debugged several thousand uh, processes without a problem in the new user interface, but we haven't debugged up to 10 or 20,000 processes there. So if you're really going high scale, um, the old classic UI has been tuned to really hit, hit some of those high scales on there. And we'll be doing some of the further tuning on there. Um, so those are just some of the areas there, and we'll highlight others as we go through. One of the things I like about the new UI is it's themed. Um, so you can have a light theme, or if you prefer a dark theme, you can choose that as well. Um, and that's just under the preferences. If you go to the display portion of the preferences, you can choose whether, uh, A, whether you want the classic or the new user interface, and if you want the light or dark theme. So. Before we get into um, talking about features, one of the things that Dean and I wanted to do was to highlight, well, how do we get in, especially to your environment um, and uh, begin using TotalView? So um, uh, Wusun mentioned um, a couple of different initial ways to do this um, using the remote display client um, for TotalView, or there is X11 forwarding, but we, do not recommend that unless you have a really close connection on there. X11 is really not built for long distance forwarding um, of displays. And um, we'll find, especially with the new user interface, since it's a rich user interface that um, it um, may, uh, it just may not perform as needed on there. So that's where the remote display client can come in and, and assist with that scenario. And then I'm gonna talk about a new feature that was just released in TotalView 2020.3, just a week or so ago. and demonstrate how to use that feature to establish a remote debugging session on, uh, on Cori. 
So um, I think what we're going to do here is I'm going to hand off to Dean, um, and he's going to uh, run through uh, a set of slides here that detail the remote display client. And uh, while he's doing that, I'm going to just uh, make sure everything's all set up to then talk about the remote user interface. So Dean, if I can stop sharing on here, let me get to stop share. Now you should be able to take over and go from All right, there. thank you. Hi everyone. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, I can do. Good. Okay, so as Bill was saying, one of the ways that we have of setting up a remote connection is the remote display client. And I, I see we already have a, a question in the chat window about that. So I'll go through how we set up a remote display client session. And uh, it consists of three different components. You have the client, which runs on your local machine, which uh, you've seen how you can access that. It's provided as part of the installation. Um, and the server, which runs on any system that's supported by TotalView, and then the viewer, which is the window that actually appears on the client system. A remote display client is available for 32-bit Linux, 64-bit Linux, as well as Windows and for Mac. So remote display client is free to install. You can install it on as many clients as you need. You don't need a license to run the client because the license is on the server side. So that's where the FlexLM license manager sits. And um, it requires SSH and X windows on the server. So the information that the user provides, you need to provide um, a username. And optionally, um, you can use a public key file or other SSH information. You need to provide the directory to where TotalView is located on the remote machine and optionally the path and name of the executable to be debugged. And if you need to take several hops in order to get to your server, um, if you have like a login uh, system, then you can optionally provide additional hops as well. Um, and if you have a back submission system such as PBS Pro or Load Leveler, you can configure this in uh, the remote display client. So a couple of couple of questions. Uh, can we, can you run the uh, RDC from ARM64? Yes, I, um, there had a question back of, are you looking to debug on the ARM or yes, are you looking to run the ARM debug app on old Corey? So from armed Corey. So we don't have a client for that supports ARM64 yet. I can jot that down as, um, as a request to do that. Um, the clients we have right now are just Windows, Linux, uh, Linux x86 to be specifics um, and, uh, and Mac. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Bill. So this is, uh, this is what the um, remote display client window looks like. You can see here, it's a single screen we have a remote host at the top, a username. Um, so you have to enter your password. It doesn't cache any passwords. And then you have a path to the total view executable. And so you can configure either total view or memory scape. And then under advanced options, you can configure additional options as well. And uh, you can store the sessions. You can see here over here on the left, we've got a session which you can store, um, you can save your session profile. So you can easily come back and you can use these, uh, you can use these again. Um, so this is just about session profile management and you can, you can share these with other users as well. Uh, so let's, uh, let's have a look how this works then. So I've got, I've got a Linux virtual machine running here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run the remote display client, which is in my path. And I've already got configured a session for Corey. So here I've got the remote host name. I've got my username for Corey up here. And then down here in the path, I've got the path to where TotalView um, is located on Corey. 
So that's pretty much all you need, just, just those three pieces of information. Um, and then I can click on launch debug session and it pops up with a window over here and it's asking me for my password and my one-time password. So I've got a really long password, which is gonna take me about five minutes to type in. So just bear with me. And then I need my one-time password as well, which... Uh, so if you set up MFA with SSH proxy, uh, uh, you will not be prompt for to enter password plus OTP. So MFA was fine. Okay. So as you can see, um, it starts total view. And if I to click on my last session, it brings up the total view window. And you can see that what we're running here is the classic total view user interface or the old user interface. So if you want to run the new total view user interface, or if you want to run uh, a script, like a Slurm script, um, you can close the total view windows down but I've still got my connection. I still have my connection here. And then I could do, say, I could do module load, total view, and then I could do a, a module load, open MPI. And then I could start total view and just give it the minus new UI flag, which will then bring up the new total view user interface. And then from here, I can choose a number of things. I can debug a program, I can debug a parallel program, I can attach to a running process, and I can load a core file or a replay engine recording file. So for example, if I click debug a parallel program, I could browse to a program. I've got an example here, hello MPI on my system. And choose the parallel system, choose open MPI, choose the number of tasks, say four, and then start load the session. And Bill's going to go through um, MPI debugging with, with us later. So he'll show you how to set up uh, an MPI uh, debugging session on Corey using uh, your particular environment. But this is just an example of how you can use remote display client and then I can set a breakpoint and then I can start debugging. And we can see that I'm running four processes and we hit the breakpoint here at line 13. So this is this is how you set up and how you can run remote display client. Any, is there any questions? So Dean, you, uh, you also created a video on this too, right? So if, if um, users wanted to see what you just demonstrated again, yeah. they can go to totalview.io and then we have under resources uh, video courses and it's just a short I think five minute video that runs through everything there too. Absolutely, yeah. So just to, just to go over it again, what you, the information you need is the remote host, the username, and the path to TotalView on the remote system. Um, but yeah, we have we have lots of resources available. So if you go to the TotalView.io website, you'll be able to access um, you'll be able to access the uh, the resources and watch the videos. I'm just going to end that debugging session. So we've got some questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't see anything new there. Okay. All 
All right, so Dean, do you want me to continue on with the other couple ways? Yeah, so I'll um, I'll hand back control to you. Bill you, <clears throat> Bill, you got a question on uh, memory leak detection. Uh, okay, let me check that there. How does total view know where to load code? Where is, oh, how to detect memory leaks? So, uh, so in Dean's case there, um, when you have the remote like client connected and you have that virtual desktop in place, um, you either, the easiest way is to run memory scape, which is just the memscape command as part of the total view module when you load that. And uh, later in the presentation today, Dean will do a, a thorough um, demonstration of how to find leaks and everything. But um, what, what Dean is showing you there and what I'm gonna show you next are just how do we get all of you set up so that you could then do what we're gonna show you through the rest of um, through today's session. So, um, so you could see in, with the RDC, how to set up that remote desktop. Um, and you could see on there, you know, Dean's is coming from many thousands of miles away connected to your system. The performance was good. Uh, he's able to debug and everything there. And it was once that session set up on there and you have a successful connection, it's easy to just double click on your session and reestablish that remote desktop in with the RDC. Um, so we'll talk more about, about uh, memory leaks uh, this um, uh, in the second segment today. Uh, let's see, question, how does TotalView know where the hello, hello world code is? So when an application is compiled, um, within that, when you build an application with what's called debug information, typically that's done by passing the dash G command, uh, switch to a compiler, it embeds within their hints of where to find the source code. Now, as long as you haven't moved where your program is from where your source code and compil compilation has been done, TotalView will just find it automatically. Um, it, it uses a number of search path algorithms to locate where the source is and pair it up correctly based on what the compiler has said. Now, um, if you have moved your program and, and TotalView can't locate the source, there are ways that you can point total view at the source location, and it will then pair it up again correctly of um, what the application is saying versus where the source resides, say maybe some other um, space on your disk. And then uh, final question, if you want to use the RDC, then yes, you can install it, but you can also use NX instead, yes. Yeah, so yeah. listen. That, yeah. that is my answer to this. Okay, so let me, um, let me now go into an alternate way um, that is a new way of doing this. So I want to share this top again. And uh, so I'm just going to go through past Dean's slides here that he had. Okay, so, um, so for an alternate way of connecting uh, to Corey um, is to use a new feature that we introduced in TotalView 2020.3, and that's called the TotalView Remote UI. And um, so this establishes the convenience of kind of what you saw with the RDC of connecting, um, establishing in the, the hops to connect to a remote host. Um, but it allows you to run that total view user interface locally on your system. Um, and so I'm not dealing with having to set up a remote desktop application um, and deal with um, dealing with all those bits and everything going across. What this allows you to do is harness the full power of say your laptop to run TotalView and, um, and communicate to uh, the debugger, which is running on a remote system on there. Uh, the communications are across to secure on there. We can save the, the sessions um, and it supports another technology that I'm gonna discuss and quickly demonstrate here called reverse connections. So let me move on here. So this is kind of a picture of what what remote user interface is gonna look like. So on the left over here, I've got a remote system. And today I'm gonna to demonstrate running TotalView from my MacBook Pro. And I'm going to establish a connection to Corey and a front end node there. And um, later on today, I will submit a job to get run into the batch nodes and using reverse connect, be able to debug all of that from my, from my laptop. 
Um, so this is um, a new capability that through that'll make it, I think, a lot easier. I, I found myself, it's, it's very nice workflow and easy to establish and do debugging remotely on a system. So as pieces of this here is when you connect it all together, um, the remote UI, that allows me to run total view on my laptop and connect to Cori. But when I submit a, something I want to debug either into the nodes or even if I manually run an application, um, I can use a couple link technology called Total View Reverse Connect that allows um, that to start and communicate with the Total View that I set up. So how does this look on here? Um, I have, um, actually before I get into some architectural diagrams on this, to, to issue the and start the reverse connect process, all you really need to do is, is prefix what you're going to run with a new command called TV connect. So you can see as part of a Slurm script here that I have my normal S run of the application that's gonna be issued um, as it's submitted to the batch system but I put TV connect in front of it. And what that will do is create a handshake between when the job is run, the waiting total view that will accept the debugging uh, session as it gets launched by the submission queue. And then from there do the handshake to get that whole debugging session, the interactive debugging session up and running. So this, uh, I'll walk through a couple steps here so you can kind of see what's happening behind the scenes. So again, we have our front end node here and total view is running on here. Now in the remote UI case, there would be one other box to the left and that's my laptop, but I could be sitting on the front end node as well. Maybe I, I have an X connection there already set up with VNC and you can issue this same type of workflow there. So when you run that TV connect, command, it's going to write a request to a common area that TotalView is monitoring on there. And then TotalView will read that request and ask the user to say, do you want to accept this incoming request? Everything here is secure. It's all in your home directory. Nobody else can write to it, but you have control to accept it or not. And then you return a response. And if it's, the, it's a, a, a yes, then the TV Connect will read that response and then issue basically an exec to start the total view remote debug servers, which will then run S run, which then launches the job as in a normal way of starting a parallel job. And once that is up and going, that remote total view server will then communicate back to what we call the total view client or the user interface, um, if it's connected to it in this fashion here to then allow you to start that interactive uh, session. So there's a lot that kind of happens underneath the covers here, but let me run through and show you kind of how it works in live here. So let me increase the size of these so that they're easier to read. And um, make sure that I have, okay, so I still get a live session on Corby here. Okay, so um, I have two windows open on here. This, the one on the left is on my Mac and I'm gonna run total view there. And then the one on the right, I've already logged into Cori and I'm gonna use that TV connect command and we're gonna start running one of the samples that are in the labs called combined on there. So I'll talk about this in a moment, but let's first start total view. Okay, so again, this is starting up on my Mac and I'm just gonna get the window to come up because it pops up in my other display. I'll try to get over. On here, second on here, I'm gonna one second, I just gotta get it. Style sheets to work correctly. All right, one second, I'm just uh, just trying to get the display. I don't know if Zoom is messing with the display a little bit. And all right, let's try one more time. 
time. Let me switch back. I'm just alternating between the themes on here. See if I can get the display with Zoom to work right. Okay. Okay. So total view is up and running. So what you'll see with this latest release is a center area called launch remote debugger. Similar to the RDC is you can define a set of configurations on where to launch total view to debug against, uh, to use for debugging. So I have several here that are configured and I have configured for Cori on here. So there's three pieces of information you give, and this should feel like the RDC because it's doing similar in that it has to establish that remote connection. So I've given it a name, just cory.nurse.gov. And here's my user information. So what it's going to do is SSH from my system out into Cori on there. And of course, I'll have to authenticate. If you needed to go through a gateway system onto other systems, you can use a comma separated list of hosts that you want to go through on here. And then lastly, just like with the RDC, you have to say where is total view. So where does it run total view on that remote system? So now that I have that all set up on there, I can then simply, and I want you to note something on here. Right now, if I look at the command line of what total view says, it's debugging on my Mac, Mac OS X Darwin. So now when I switch to Cori on here, and I have to now authenticate, um, I have not uh, my window is over here. Hold on, I used a different window to launch everything. So where I launch total view from, it's gonna ask for my password and my OTP. So one second, and again, Wusun, I need to do the same as what you suggested for Dean and getting those keys set up correctly. But so um, I'll put my password in and then my OTP. Okay, so once that's in there, what's going to happen is now total view, the what we call the, the client portion or the total view debug engine is now running on Cori. And you'll see here now I'm connected to a Linux environment. I'm no longer debugging on my Mac. I'm doing things remotely. I could launch and, and start debugging a program like Dean said with debugger program and we'll talk more about this as we go through the usage of total view. But on the flip side here, what I'm gonna do is now I'm logged into Cori over here, I'm gonna use TV Connect. And right now I'm gonna do it at just a simple local application here. So let's do TV Connect. And you'll notice I'm giving the full path here. I'd use backtick PWD and combine because sometimes if, depending on how environments change on here, um, Total view may not be able to find your executable. So I always suggest putting the full path to the program you wanna debug on there. So that's why I'm doing that. Total view is getting that request. Do you wanna accept the connection? Yes, I wanna accept that connection. So now the program is part of my debug session here. I can see the source and I can start to step into my program and start doing debugging with total view. Again, I'm sitting in Boston. My total view user interface is sitting on my Mac here with me and I'm communicating and running now out in Cori uh, in, in California. And we'll have very good response, very good ability to look at data, debug the application, set breakpoints and everything there. Um, you can do multiple of these TV connects if you were to end one session and start another one. Um, if you have a job that's running there, once it's accepted, you can uh, and run, you can then begin that in total view as well. Okay, so this is um, an alternate way. And I think, I know myself, I find it a very convenient way to just get total view running, log in to Cori, I'm working in that environment. And then I'm, when I'm ready to either submit a job or just start debugging an application, I use TV Connect and it establishes this connection on here and I just start debugging within my session here on Total View. Any questions on that? Let me just kind of zoom in. Okay. okay. 
All right, uh, let me go back to the slides and see where I, so Dean and I will be using um, different techniques as we demo today. Um, I will do a, a demo similar to this, but we'll actually submit an MPI job into Corey's queue later on um, and show how to do MPI debugging in this scenario as well. So Dean, I think we're on to you to kind of go through startup. Let me stop sharing. All right, thanks, Bill. And I'll take a look at some of the chat here and see if there's uh, anything I can answer. Okay, so let me share my screen. So hopefully you can all see startup. Yes, I can do. Yeah. Great. So when you start TotalView for the first time with the new user interface, what you see is a screen similar to this one. And you have a number of options. So starting from the left, we can debug a program. Um, so that's straightforward. You, we can debug a parallel program. Um, again, that's very useful. Um, it helps you in the sense that you fill in the required information. So you choose the uh, MPI implementation that you want to use, the number of processes and the number of nodes. We can attach to a running process and we can load a core file or a replay engine calling file. Um, so this is actually uh, a screenshot from the 2020.2 release. And you'll notice that listen for reverse connections is there, but Remote Connect, which Bill's just shown, um, isn't on there because that's obviously something that's um, brand new. And we also have a list of what's new. So it tells you what's in the current release. And then over here on the right, you have your recent sessions. So um, any program that you've recently debugged, you can give it a session name and you're able to just click on that and then you can load up the session very easily and you can start debugging um, one, of your, one of your last sessions. So when you're debugging, uh, if you choose debugging a new program, this is the screen you see. Um, as, a, as I said, you can give it a session name. So the program that Bill uh, showed us just now was called Combined. And you have a path to, uh, to the application, optionally any additional arguments. And you can turn on reverse debugging and you can turn on Python debugging if it's a, if it's a mixed C or C++ and Python application. Um, we can also choose environment variables. So, for example, if we were debugging an o, uh, OpenMP program, we can set the uh, number of OMP threads in here. And we can also do redirection of uh, standard input. And then you just click on load session and you can start debugging your application. If it's a, if it's a parallel application, um, then you choose your parallel system from the drop down list of uh, any of the MPI implementations that we support. Optionally, um, and, and you specify the number of tasks, uh, any additional starter arguments, um, the path to the application itself, and any uh, arguments for the program. And again, you can turn on reverse debugging and Python debugging as well. Um, if you want to attach to a running program, then this is uh, any of the processes that are running on your application. So you may have a, a long running application that's uh, running on your, pro on, on, your, on your system and uh, you can simply attach to that. And you can even do it by choosing uh, from the list of uh, processes um, from the tree list here, or if you know the process ID, you can specify that in the list and you can attach to that. And this could be very useful when you're trying to um, uh, attach to um, MPI programs as well. Um, you can also open uh, a core file. So if your application uh, produces a core file, if it crashes, you get a segmentation fault. And if your, your system's set up to create core files, then you can load up a core file. Um, so you specify the location to the core file and the name of the core file and also the application name here. Um, if you have a replay engine recording, and we'll look at replay engine uh, a bit later on after the break, 
if you have a, a saved replay engine recording file, you can also specify that here. And again, you need to specify the replay engine recording name and uh, the application that that relates to. And as I mentioned, we have, um, you have a list of the recent sessions. So these are, these are recent programs that you've debugged. You can, you can click on any of these and that will take you into them as well. And the, the little pen icon here um, is just a quick way you can click on that and then you can start to edit the information that's in the session. So if you need to change anything about that session, you can do so just by clicking on the little pen icon. Okay, so that's um, that's startup. Was there were there some questions that we need to look at? I saw some. Uh, I saw something in the chat. So Dean, I'm answering a few of the questions going through. I don't think okay. there's anything specific on startup yet. Um, a few remaining ones on RDC that I'm answering now. Yeah. All right. Great. So, um, are there any questions specifically related to to Telview startup? Okay, so we'll continue then. The next topic is user interface navigation and process control. So types of use default views, the new user interface um, is built with Qt and we've got a very nice user interface over here on the left, we have the processes and threads view. Next to that, we have the lookup file or function view. And then lastly, we have the documents tab. In the center of the screen, we have the source view. And over on the right, we have the call stack. And underneath that, the local variables view. And then in the center at the bottom, we have the data view, we have the command line tab, we have the logger, and we have the input output tab. And at the far left, we have the action points tab and the replay engine bookmarks. And if you find, you can always drag and drop the windows around, you can resize them, you can, you can basically arrange the, the view as you would like to see it, the user interface. Um, and if you want to, uh, change that, you can easily do that from the view menu. You can reset the view very easily. So the processes and the threads view shows you the current state of your application. And it shows you all of the, uh, all of the running processes and threads in your application. And you can group these by various different attributes. And that's what we see here in this window here. So you can turn on or off the different attributes that you want to group by. So if you're debugging a multi-process uh, application, an MPI application, you're probably going to want to turn on process state and process ID. If it's a multi-threaded application, in that case, you're probably going to want to look at thread state and thread ID. So you can configure exactly what attributes um, you want to group by. And um, this little uh, arrow here, this little half circle arrow, that's the reset. So if you want to reset it to its default state, you can easily do so. So the source view gives you a view of uh, your source code, as you'd expect. Um, currently, we only so show the source, whereas uh, the classic user interface, you're able to see the source and the assembly code side by side. So if you need to look at the assembly code, then you'll need to um, use the classic user interface for the time being. Over here on the left, you can see the uh, line numbers and the line numbers that are involved are the line numbers that you can set breakpoints on. Is there an executable line of code? So the call stack view and the local variables panel, the call stack obviously shows you uh, the stack frame so you can move up and down the functions and the local variables um, obviously shows you the uh, variables that are in scope. And then we have the action points and the replay engine bookmarks tab. So the action points are all of the action points that you've defined. And the replay engine bookmarks um, are the bookmarks that you can set when you're doing a replay engine recording. So replay engine bookmarks are a very nice way of being able to easily navigate around your code. Just by double clicking on um, a replay engine bookmark, you can go immediately to 
a particular line of code. And we'll see that later on in an example. And then we have the data view, the command line view and the logger. So the data view is a really nice um, window where you can, um, you can drag and drop uh, the vari local variables so that you can keep them in scope and uh, you can view them. Um, the command line, you can see exactly what's happening um, in, in the debugging session. And you can also type commands directly into the command line as well. Um, and the logger just gives you some additional information. So the lookup file or function um, allows you to search for um, expressions. So in this particular example, um, we're inside this file here, read expression.c. And if we type, if we start typing, so example, ex, then TotalView will bring up all of the matching uh, items. And you can simply double click on any one of these and it will take you directly to that particular, um, either to that file or to that point in the, in the source code. And then display settings, um, under display settings, uh, you can choose the user interface style. So you can choose the new user interface or the classic user interface. And then when you restart TotalView, that will default to um, whichever one you chose. And you can also do that from the command line as well, as we saw earlier on. So if you want to start with a new user interface, you give it the dash new UI command flag. Or if you want to start with a classic user interface, it's the my dash classic UI. Um, looking at the TotalView toolbar then, these are the uh, TotalView uh, toolbar commands. So the green arrow is the go command, which sets the thread to running until it reaches a stopping point, which is typically a break point, but it could stop for other reasons. The next button across is the halt button, which stops the thread at its current execution point. The red uh, square button is the kill button, which stops program execution. Um, the restart button uh, restarts the program from the beginning. So uh, the existing breakpoints and other settings remain in effect. So that's the same as clicking uh, kill followed by go. Uh, next moves you to the next line of execution. Um, step actually steps into a function call and out steps out of a function call and run to um, executes all the lines of code up to a particular line. So with the run to option, you can highlight a line of code and then you can select run to and it's a, a very nice way of executing all of the statements up to that particular line. Okay, so uh, looking at the stepping commands uh, in more detail then, here's an example. Um, we're at line 30 and we can tell that by the program counter here, which is highlighted in yellow. And we're at this line here, uh, set JMP uh, context. And if we were to select uh, step, it would move on to the next line of code, which would be line 31. Um, so, if we select step again, we then go into the read expression function. Um, next would step over it um, or execute it. And we also have the option of resuming execution from an arbitrary point. So from the thread menu, you can choose uh, set PC, which is set program counter. Um, in this particular example, the program counter is pointing at line 1110. Um, you can select a line of code, for example, 1115, and then you can choose uh, set program counter. And what TotalView does, it will then um, resume execution from this line, but without executing all the previous lines um, between 1110 and 1115. So basically, you, TotalView is allowing you to uh, jump control uh, to this particular line. So that's how it differs from the run to, because if you would choose the run to, it would execute all of the lines of code up to that, up to this particular line. So it's a way of, um, you can just have total view resume execution from an arbitrary point within your program. 
Okay, so I've just got a, um, a brief demo here just to show you uh, some, of the, some of the things that we've been looking at. Um, so I'm just going to start TotalView, start up the user interface. And I'm going to choose um, a recent session, and this is called the QT thread example. So I'm just going to click on this, and it's going to load the application for me. And this particular application is a Qt-based um, GUI application. So when I press go to start debugging, it's going to bring up the application. And we can see here that it's, uh, it's a very simple uh, GUI. It um, allows us to visually uh, see four threads being incremented. And if I go ahead and click start, we can see that the thread counter for each of the threads is going up. And uh, it's just a nice visual way. So if I right click on that and say always on top, then we can keep that in scope. If I, if I go up here and pause the execution by pressing halt, um, we can have a look at the attributes. And these are the attributes that I was mentioning. So we can see here that we're focusing by share group, by thread state, and by thread ID, which looks about right for this particular multi-threaded application. If it was an MPI application, we'd probably want to turn on process state and process ID. Um, and you've got various different options. You can also choose to uh, source line as well. So you can turn on um, source line. And we've got these radio buttons here, which have different views. So it's a nice way of choosing the focus. And you can also focus by tree view or by a list view as well. So if you have lots of if you're running with lots of processes and threads, probably the tree, the tree view is the more appropriate way of focusing. So if I want to change focus at any time, you can see here at the top, I'm focusing now on process one, thread one, which is 1.1. Uh, if I want to change the focus at any time, I can just double click on a thread, and now I'm focusing on thread 1.8. Um, if I want to have a look at the source code, I can go over to my call stack, and I can see here, I've got some C++ um, functions here. Here's the do work function. I can easily focus on that. And now I'm inside this uh, do work um, function over here. Um, also, I can, uh, from the drop down list, um, at the moment, it's set to group control, which is all of the processes and threads. I can, from this drop down list, I can choose an individual process or an individual thread. And then all of the toolbar buttons will just um, activate on an, either a process or an individual thread, whichever is in focus. So if I choose an individual thread now, I'm focusing on thread 1.8, then we can just step that individual thread. So if I start to run that individual thread, um, I also need to run the main uh, GUI thread, uh, which is either thread uh, 1.1 or 1.2. It's usually the one that I don't choose, so it's probably 1.2. And then if we run that, then you can see over here in my QT application that we're incrementing just one of the threads. And this is uh, thread 1.8 being incremented. We can see that thread counter is just going up. So using the total view controls, we've got very fine grained control over individual threads and processes. And this is a really powerful feature of total view. If I go back to the group control, I can then uh, pause the application, change it back to group control, which is all of the threads, and then I can resume execution. And now you can see that all of the threads are being executed in this particular application. So TotalView lets you control individual threads and processes. And this is great for um, things like race conditions and, and deadlocks. Let me just Stop this particular application and exit out from here. So this was just a summary, um, a recap of the things we've looked at in, in the user interface. So any, any questions about um, the user interface controls so far? Oops, sorry. How are we doing with... Okay. Not, not related to uh, user interface. Other questions? Yeah, I know I don't have any other specific to what you've been going over yet, Dean, just chatting on a few other things around RDC still. Sure, okay. 
So let's carry on um, and move to the next topic, which is action points. So we have uh, four different types of action points that we can use within TotalView. We have the standard breakpoints, which we've already seen. We have eval points, we have watch points, and we have barrier points. And we'll cover each of these in a bit more detail. So setting breakpoints is very straightforward. As I uh, mentioned earlier, any line that's uh, bold, you can set a breakpoint on. And you can do this by single clicking the line number or you can right click the line number and use the context menu set breakpoint. Or you can go to the action points uh, menu option and use the set breakpoint option there. So there's three different ways of setting breakpoints within TotalView, but they all have the same effect. And you can view your, your breakpoints um, in the action points tab. So it will show you all of the active and uh, non active breakpoints that have been set for your particular application. So this is just to um, reiterate what I mentioned. You can set it from the action points menu at location. And here's an example of setting a breakpoint on line 119 um, on, in the file read expression.c. So that's, if you want to set it on a particular line number in a file, that's how you do it using the, the, the hashtag. Um, you can also set it on a function. So, if you know the name of a function, um, in this case, um, draw a circle, um, you can type the name of the function in there and it will set, and TotalView will set the breakpoint at the first executable line in the function. Um, pending breakpoints, this is when um, you set a breakpoint on a library that hasn't yet been loaded into memory and TotalView will uh, set a pending breakpoint and you'll see that it's a pending breakpoint because in the action points tab, it will say brackets pending. And then when the library um, is loaded into memory, that breakpoint will become active. So it will no longer be pending. And we'll see this um, later on when we look, we look at the Python example. You can modify breakpoints. So if you uh, right click on a, a breakpoint, you can enable, disable, or delete the breakpoint. And you can also adjust the breakpoints width. So you can change it from a uh, group, which is all the running threads in all the processes in the group. You can change it to the process, which is just the running threads in the process that contains the thread that hit the breakpoint. Or you can choose an individual thread. So this is the first thread that executes to this breakpoint. So uh, when you set your breakpoints, you've got, um, again, very fine grained control over whether it's group process or, or thread that you will stop when um, a thread hits the breakpoint. We also have evaluation points and evaluation points are uh, a really nice feature that allows you to um, basically uh, stop a process and its relatives. And you can use this to test out potential fixes or patches for your program without having to recompile your application. So you can test out a, a small patch inside an eval point. And um, if that patch fixes the problem, then you can roll it out into your production code. You can also um, include a go-to, so that will transfer control um, so basically what you would typically do is you would write a small patch and then you would have a go to in order to jump over the lines of code in the application that you didn't want to run. You don't want to execute the, uh, the code twice. Um, you can also execute a total view function and you can set the values of your programs variables and you can also use it just to just to do a printf. So I know a lot of people like printf debugging. If you want to put a printf inside your eval point, um, just to print out the value of a variable to, your, to the um, command line, then you can do so. Um, so here's some examples of uh, eval points, and uh, you'll find more examples in our documentation. 
But um, as I mentioned, here's an example of using uh, printf um, to print out the value uh, of a result. Um, here's an example of using a go to. Um, so basically transferring control to a particular line of code. Um, and you can do that to jump over um, a section of code. Um, typically, you would do that after you've, um, after you've used a patch um, to try and um, fix a problem in your code. And you can also use it um, to stop a loop after a certain number of iterations. So in this case, we're checking um, if I uh, mod 100 is equal to zero. And in that case, it's going to print out the value of I and then it's going to stop. So uh, dollar stop is one of the reserved total view keywords that you can use inside um, an, eval, an eval point. So eval points are very useful, um, very powerful. The third type of uh, action points we have are watch points. And watch points are set on a specific memory location. So um, what happens is execution stops um, when the value stored in that memory location changes. And uh, the difference between uh, breakpoints and watch points is that a breakpoint stops uh, before an instruction executes, whereas a watch point stops after an instruction executes. So if you want to um, check when uh, the value of a variable changes, you can set up a watch point on it, and then total view will stop execution when that value changes. Um, so here's some examples of some watch point expressions, and uh, total view has got two uh, variables that are used exclusively with watch points. So dollar old val is the value of the memory location before the change, and dollar new val is the value of the memory location after the change is made. So here's an example here. We're checking uh, if a particular variable is not equal to uh, either 42 or, or 44. And then we're setting, uh, we're setting the, the new value and uh, the old value. And then here's a second example. It's checking if uh, the old value is uh, greater than zero and the new value is less than zero. And if so, then it's going to stop execution. So that's again using the total view reserved keyword dollar stop inside the uh, watch point. And the last type of uh, action points that we have are barrier breakpoints. And uh, these are used uh, for synchronization. They're used to synchronize a group of threads or processes defined in the action point. And um, basically, what happens is uh, you create your bar barrier point. And then um, all of the threads or processes will be held um, until uh, all the threads and processes arrive at that particular barrier point. So if you were debugging, for example, an MPI application um, with um, 16 MPI ranks and you were to set a barrier point, then total view would hold all of the MPI ranks until all 16 ranks have arrived at that particular barrier point. And then when they have all arrived at that barrier point, um, that barrier point was said to be uh, satisfied and total view would allow the execution to continue. So the next time you press any of the go or next or step statements, it would advance all, all of the MPI ranks. Um, by default, um, total view doesn't save your breakpoints. So if you want to save them, you can either click on the save breakpoints option and save them to a file, or you can turn on the save action points option. Um, so you have two different, two different ways of doing that. So the default is um, that the action points aren't automatically saved. If you want to save them, then either save them when you've finished the debugging um, or you've finished setting your action points, or turn on the option to save the breakpoints automatically. Okay, um, do we have any questions about action points? Nothing in the chat, Dean, so far. Okay. 
Right, so um, we'll carry on then with the next topic, which is examining and editing data. So the call stack view consists of two different panels. We have the call stack panel and underneath we have the local variables panel. And the local variables panel uh, displays all of the variables for the thread of interest. So the data view panel um, could be used in order to uh, drag and drop the local variables. And you can do that either by right clicking on the variable in the local variables tab. So if you right click on it, um, use the right mouse click, you'll have the option to add to data view. Um, alternatively, from the local variables window, you can just simply drag the variable um, across into the data view. And uh, it will then uh, be available for you to view inside the data view. Um, if you have uh, a, uh, an array or a structure and um, you want to um, view all of the elements in, of that array or that structure in the data view, you have, um, you have an arrow here. Um, if you just click on that arrow so that it becomes a, a downward facing arrow, then total view will expand out all of the elements of the array and you can see um, the entire array. Um, if you want to dive on a, a single individual element within the data view, you can do that. And uh, to total view will show that element for you within the data view panel. So here we're looking at um, item uh, seven inside an array. And if you right click on that and select dive, then total view will display that as a separate line item within the data view panel. You can also type expressions directly into the data view and uh, total view will um, display the value of that expression. And you can um, increment variables as well. So you can perform um, addition, subtraction, et cetera, within uh, that particular data view. And total view will display the value for you as well. So you've got um, quite a lot of flexibility within the data view for displaying um, variables and for incrementing variables as well. Um, if you have a, a ver uh, if you dive on a variable, it isn't uh, dereferenced automatically. So if you have a pointer, um, for example, this is a pointer to uh, a string, you can make it editable and you can dereference the pointer. And then total view displays the, the variable's value. You can also cast um, variable types to a different type. Um, typically, we, you might want to do this if you have a, a pointer to an array and you want to display the entire array. So you just need to tell total view that um, uh, what the size of the array is just by double clicking inside the, um, the variable type. And then you can uh, specify the number of elements in the array and then total view will display the entire array for you. Um, if you're viewing data in Fortran and uh, you're looking at um, a module, then uh, total view displays in, in the call stack, it displays the qualified subroutine name and the local variables as well um, appear um, in the local variables tab uh, qualified with the module name. Um, <clears throat> For each common block um, within uh, a, a subroutine or a function, total view creates uh, an entry in that function's common block list. And the names uh, of the common block members have uh, function scope, not global scope. So if you select them in the call stack view, uh, the common block and the variables appear in the local variables panel.
And if you have any user defined types in the local variables uh, panel, you can add these to the data view for more detail as well. So again, dragging and dropping over into the data view or um, right clicking and selecting add to data view. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so let's carry on to um, advanced C++ and data debugging. So TotalView um, understands many of the STL containers, things like arrays, lists, tuples, maps, sets, vectors, and others. So when you're looking at um, an array or a list or a set, TotalView uh, won't display the raw STL data um, as we see down here on the bottom. What you'll actually see is in this particular case, um, we're looking at a map. The TotalView will show you the key and the value there. So in other words, it's giving you the information that um, you're most interested in seeing. Um, TotalView understands the STL containers and it automatically does the transformation for you. So you don't need to do anything um, in order to see the, um, the values. We also have advanced support for C++ 11, 14 and 17 features, including things like lambdas, smart pointers, autotypes, et cetera. So if you're working with uh, the latest C++ uh, features, then TotalView will display those correctly for you. If you're working with um, an array and you want to be able to um, slice the array or stride, use the striding or filtering, um, in the classic user interface, uh, we have this uh, array window, which is, um, you can just, uh, you can get this by right clicking on an array and selecting dive and total will pop up this uh, variable window. And then you can um, type uh, an array slice or a filter expression and total view will uh, display that for you correctly. So that's in the classic user interface. And also, um, if you want to look at uh, an array in a 2D table format, again, in the classic user interface, we have this um, array viewer. And uh, you're able to select any two dimensions, the I and the J column uh, here. So if you have a three or a four dimensional array, for example, you can uh, specify any two dimensions. TotalView will allow you to choose the start index, the end index, and optionally um, a stride pattern as well. So if you only want to see every, um, say, second or third element in the array. And um, the array viewer is uh, scrollable as well. So you can scroll vertically and horizontally. Um, again, if you want to use this array viewer, um, you'll need to use the classic user interface at the moment. Um, we also have array statistics. So if you're looking at an array, um, we can, you can bring up statistics about the array. Um, things like the min, the max, the medium, standard deviation, and uh, a checksum as well. Um, so quite a lot of information about the array itself. And um, as, uh, as Bill mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, we have the ability to be able to visualize array data. And this visualizer is available um, through the classic user interface. And you can do it through um, the window. So if you basically dive on an array, you have the array, um, the, vari the variable uh, array, array window, you can then select visualize and TotalView will uh, visualize the array for you. And you can also do it programmatically as well. So you could um, create a breakpoint, um, an eval breakpoint, and you could use the dollar visualize and then the name of the array 
and total view would um, it would hit the breakpoint and then it would pop up the visualize window as well. So um, it's a nice way of being able to view your data graphically, which uh, in a lot of examples is, um, is more meaningful than viewing an array of data. You can particularly look for outliers in, in your array data. Um, are we getting, what are we doing? Um, we also have uh, the option um, dive in all. So dive in all allows you to easily see each uh, each member of a data structure from a, from an array of structures. So in this particular uh, array, um, we have uh, an array of structures, and each structure contains um, an element um, A. And so if you right click and say dive in all, TotalView will create a completely new array for you that only focuses on the A element from within the, the original structure. 